song's normally longer than that. I don't know what it was so short. It gives me plenty of time to get up here. Chip, what's up? Let's, let us have That's a prayer, great. Bob. You reckon? Have a prayer? I we'll pray we for need, Chip. One of us needs one. <laughs> Bow with me, please. Father, we're so grateful for another day of life. Thank you so much for your love that makes everything possible. Thank you for the time you've given us, Father, to worship you. And we pray that you'll bless Gary as he brings us another lesson. Help him to remember the things he studied, Father, and and be with us. Help us to learn and to make application to our lives that we might be more the people you'd have us to be. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. So, good morning, church. Well, we do have children's church in the back for uh, any of our children that want to head back there. Or adults as well, if you decided you don't want to be in here, I guess you go back there as well. Might as well get something out of today, right? So all the thunder and lightning and rain, Rhonda asked me before I came up, she was going to preach a hell and damnation sermon today? <laughs> no, I hadn't planned on that, but uh, <laughs> we'll see what we have. Um, it's good to see all of you here today, all of our guests. Thanks for being here down on the beautiful, sunny Emerald Coast. Hopefully you put your windows up in your car, right? Or uh, you'll have a carpool <laughs> when you go back out. Dad joke. <laughs> it is good to have you here. Today is a day that we uh, recognize our graduating high school seniors. Uh, we have Connor and Reuben here today that uh, will, are graduates this year. We're excited about that. I know a lot of guests here. You know, we, we must have some other folks. Anybody else here who graduated high school? I did. <laughs> that was, <laughs> y'all want, ah, I'm the only one. No, no, no one else, or you're too bashful to raise your hand. And, or, or, or even college. Well, good. We do have a college grad back there. So you might be wondering, well, today won't even be applicable to me because I'm not a recent high school graduate or a college graduate or anything, but you would be wrong because it will be applicable to you. We're going to talk about some things today that uh, I think we can definitely all use. Uh, also, before we get into that, as Luke had mentioned, this week of blessing here in uh, Destin, uh, looking forward to that. This is my first year participating in it. Uh, I do have some apprehension uh, go, going into it, but look at, definitely looking forward to it. Two biggest things is the marketplace and the blessing of the fleet, which will be uh, very neat to see. And um, you, you have to understand these uh, captains of the boats, fishing boats and other boats as well, they actually sign up because they want the blessing. They want people to pray over them for safety, for a good year, for a good harvest. And, and all like that. So um, if you're here, uh, the Blessing of the Fleet will be on Thursday, as Luke said, 4 to 7, and uh, down at the harbor. And uh, just go to where the crowd of people are. Uh, behind Brotulas. Behind Brotulas. Brotulas, if you know where Brotulas is. Uh, or you can look for me. I'll be the bald guy with the beard. So an exciting week uh, uh, this, this week. So, you know, making it through 12 years of high school, um, I, I couldn't help when I was putting this together to think back on my time and going through high school and, and all the different things uh, going on, meeting some real challenges there. And, you know, it doesn't in there. Life is still going to have challenges to you no matter where you go, through your work life, even retirement. Now you think, well, I'll retire. There will, no, there will be no more challenges. Well, I hate to break it to all of you folks still working. You are wrong. There will be challenges. 
The first will be your wife wondering, what am I going to do with this guy around here all day? How do I know that? Been there, done that. But you know, we meet challenges. We meet challenges, and we should meet them head on as we go through life. And you know, we already have some victories under our belt, and there's more challenges and all like that. But uh, I want, especially our graduates, but all of us today, to think of the encounters that you've already experienced with success. You know, if you think about it, you've already graduated several times. You graduated when you were born. Ta-da! I'm here! You graduated when you adjusted to life on the outside, and you graduated from infancy, and, and, you, and you went to that first day of kindergarten, and then you probably graduated kindergarten. Even I graduated kindergarten. They used to do kindergarten graduations even back in the early days. I remember it like it was yesterday, to be honest with you. It was an exciting part. I even had something I had to say. And I remember what it was I had to say, but I won't tell you what that is right now. <laughs> but you graduate, you went to, co- uh, to, to kindergarten, and then you, you, you go through the, the teen years, and you go through, and you graduate, get, getting ready to graduate high school, exciting time, a uh, big milestone there. And then, and then you come to the road of adulthood. Adulthood. Because... You see, once you graduate high school, everything then is smooth sailing. (laughs) And it is going to be so great. And I can remember thinking, boy, I cannot wait till I graduate high school. Life is going to be so good. I can sleep in and do whatever I want to. Boy, was that a wake-up call or what? Then I met the real world. So I'm not here to scare any of our graduates, but I I want to put a few things in your toolbox today that you can take with us. David, you have that video queued up for us? from God's Word that will provide a little guidance for us, I, I, I think, uh, for not only our graduates, but for all of us who are gathered here uh, today. <laughs> so, I think we've all been in life, those times where we get... Uh, a little afraid of something. If, 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 if you know, for, for somebody like me, when I was in high school, I took uh, speech classes. Now, I was, all, I, I was also involved in, in uh, Lads to Leaders many years ago uh, for several years. And uh, doing that, it was kind of, you know, they teaching you how to do public speaking and being in front of people and all. But I also took speech classes uh, in, in, cl- in uh, high school. And for a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people, public speaking, if you put it on a scale, it is the number one, it's the top thing someone would rather not do. I do not want to be in front of people speaking. Number one, it is for me. I hate it. 
<laughs> I'm lying. It doesn't bother me a whole lot. But um, it is one of the worst things that someone could do. And I would look around at my classmates because it didn't bother me as much. There were other things that bothered me more, such as uh, calculus, four, you know? That bothered me, so I never took it. I never took three, two, or one. I never took calculus at all because it bothered me that bad. But I did take speech. That didn't bother me. Speech, eh, that, that, that's okay. And then you get that impromptu speech where, I don't know if, if your teachers had it, where they had a bowl and they gave you like a minute where you had to pick a topic and go up and you had a minute to gather your thoughts and talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. And so here I am in high school, and I get it, and I look at my topic, this doesn't bother me, and my topic is, why is water wet? <laughs> okay, I got this. You know, being naturally bright like I am, I said, hey, I got this. So I got up there and I had to give a five-minute speech. I said, well, you know, why is water wet? And while I might not know exactly why water is wet, I do know this that you need to be baptized in water, you're going straight to hell and fry like a Jimmy Dean sausage. <laughs> Y'all say, did you really do that in high school? No, not exactly. I didn't go that far with it. But I had to do a speech, and other people had to do speeches, and like that, they were there sweating it out, scared to death because they had to get up in front of people. It didn't matter what the topic was. That wasn't the point. They just knew that they had to get up in front of people and give a speech. Well, those are physiological reactions that some people have, where they're sweating, where their hands are cold but their body is hot, where they're getting ready to get in front of people to speak. And a lot of times, people are dominated by a spirit of fear. That kind of fear that paralyzes us and keeps us from doing things we could or we should do. Sometimes fear will absolutely paralyze you. So it's with this in mind that, you know, I'm going to give you a first guideline to success. And the first one is, to face your fears. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Now, you got, you got to see here on, on this verse. It, it was, this verse was written to a young man, written to Timothy. Perhaps a little bit older than our graduates, I don't know. He was a young preacher at the church there of Ephesus, and the Apostle Paul was his mentor. And Paul encouraged Timothy in his first letter, not let others intimidate him because of his young age. And Timothy was afraid of being inadequate as a young preacher. He lacked self-confidence. And so here in the second letter to, to Timothy, Paul reminds him that, that any cowardice in his life did not come from God's Spirit. And so he tells him here in 1 Timothy 1.7, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love. And self-control. Wow. God gives us a spirit, but not one of fear. When we became Christians, the Holy Spirit of God came to us. Y'all remember that, right? Acts 2.38. We received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. With God in control, we face our fears. He gives, us to do, he gives us the ability to do what life demands. To love when others hate and to be under control when others throw restraint into the winds. Remember those things. To love when others hate and to be under control. Under control when other people are not under control. Being self controlled. Max Cato said, fear doesn't want you to make the journey to the mountain. If he can rattle you enough, fear will persuade you to take your eyes off the peaks and settle for a dull existence in the flatlands. Because of fear, 
Because of fear, we're held back. Graduates, face your fears. You know, I, I don't know what your future plans are right now. Maybe staying home, maybe going away to college, but to all of you, you know, you know, living far away from home can be fearful at times. I did not go to college straight out of high school. I went into the Air Force, and I don't know how, I know we have some veterans here, and I don't know how that very first day and night of basic training were for you, but if it was anything like me, as you were lying there in the cot, after having been welcomed by a training instructor in a smoky bear hat who wasn't the nicest fella you'd ever meet, you're lying there and saying, Lord, what have I done? What have I done? Yeah. Any of you experienced that? <laughs> yeah. So I done messed up now. I want to go back home. But they don't let you just do that for some reason. So being away from home can be fearful at times. Going to a job interview can be a little traumatic on us. Not having any friends, you know, where you're going can be devastating. But God has not given you a spirit of fear. It's God's will to move you from fear to confidence. You're called, we are called to live courageously. To trust the enablement of God's spirit. God can and will use your life. But you know what? You've got to be willing to face your fears. And graduates, you've got to be willing to allow the Spirit to use your life. Saying yes to a godly lifestyle is a difficult job oftentimes. Saying yes to a godly lifestyle can be a courageous thing saying no listen to me listen to me on this saying no to drugs to parties that you shouldn't go to to places and to places let me tell you this graduate to go into places you shouldn't be let me get my finger out and point at you now going where you shouldn't be and you know what let me tell you this, you know where those places are. You know where they are. Well, I'm not so sure about this. If you ever, you ever wonder, should I go to this or go to that? You call me, and I'll tell you whether you should go there or not. It's as, it's as simple as that. Night or day, give me a call. And I said, no, you don't go there. I'm going to tell your mom and daddy. No, actually, I wouldn't if you had requested I not. But nevertheless, nevertheless, let me tell you, you want to die? Get into the drug scene. Get into the scene of doing the things that you know you shouldn't be do, doing. I know for our two graduates, Connor and Reuben, I know how they were raised by good mamas and daddies who raised them up right here amongst all of us. And they know right from wrong. But sometimes we like to stray. I was raised in a good home and I knew right from wrong. And I lived a perfect life. I never did anything wrong. <laughs> and that's a lie. When you go away from home, remember the things taught at home. Be courageous. Don't be fearful. Live that godly lifestyle. Say no to the things that you know are wrong. Saying yes to the good things. Saying yes to honesty. Saying yes to integrity. In the Air Force, we have a saying. Service before self. 
integrity in all we do. And there's another one I can't think of right now. But nevertheless, you know, I, I think of those and the integrity in whatever it is that we do. Integrity. Saying yes to integrity. Saying yes to honesty. In your academic environment or wherever you go, that's a courageous, courageous thing. In facing the fear of a bad grade. One of the biggest challenges you will face is the battle for honesty. Let me tell you, dishonesty is rooted in fear. You know what? Sometimes you might fail. You might fail. And sometimes failure is not such a bad thing. A rancher asked a veterinarian for some advice. Rancher said, you know what, I got a horse, and that horse, well, that horse walks normally sometimes, but sometimes that horse limps. And he asked the vet, he said, what should I do? The vet told him, he said, next time, the next time that horse walks normally, sell him. <laughs> you know, dishonesty is the norm today. I tell you, I... I I, I am sometimes afraid to deal with certain businesses because I'm afraid of the dishonesty. I almost become rather cynical, such as going to a used car dealership. I don't know why I'm that way, but I have to pray before I go into there that I will be a good Christian person. Maybe I'm the only one here like that, I guess. Face your fears. Face your fears. Dishonesty will be all around you. Face your fears of a poor grade. Face your fears of maybe not getting a job that you want or losing, losing something, losing a profit if necessary. You know, God, God has promised us so much. Promised us so much. And sometimes we get fearful over things in life. There was a test conducted by a university where 10 students were placed in a room and three lines of different links were drawn on a card. The students were told to raise their hands when the instructor pointed to the longest line. But nine of the students had been instructed beforehand to raise their hands when the instructor pointed to the second longest line. One student was the stooge, basically. That one student didn't know about that. The usual reaction of the, the, the one student was to put his hand up when he saw the longest line and realizing he was all alone, he'd pull it back down. That happens 75% of the time with students from grade school through high school. The researchers concluded that many would rather stand with the majority than risk being right but being alone. Now is the time when you'll have to face some of your fears squarely with a firm confidence in God. Never ever take your cues from the crowd if our fears don't keep us from navigating life then an inappropriate response to failure may do that philippians chapter 3 verse 12 through 14 here paul's in prison he's changed to, chained to a roman guard probably pretty poor conditions there and he says, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of, of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Now listen to what Paul's saying here. Forgetting what is behind. Paul had been a pretty bad dude. Persecuting Christians, doing the wrong things. Not a good guy. Here he's saying, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on 
toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul is making two implications here in this statement. The first one is he refuses to allow failure to become destructive in his life. He refuses to allow failure to beset his journey to his goal. Failure. The fear of failure. That will freeze many people. Well, I might fail, so I won't attempt this. Well, that's safe. Because you definitely won't have to worry about failure if you don't attempt it in the first place. Paul put his past behind him. He determined to have a positive mental attitude in life. There are going to be failures. None of us are perfect. It's not a matter of if you fail, but, but when you fail. And when we fail, we must learn from it and put it behind us. We must never allow failure to make us quit trying. I did take, I've told some of you this before, the hardest class I ever took throughout school, throughout 12 years of school, throughout undergrad throughout grad school the hardest class was uh, was was physics for me physics I, I don't know people whose mind really understands that they're not normal people <laughs> they can't be bless your hearts if you are a physicist I'm not trying to offend you uh, but that class was so difficult for me. My, my, I mean, I've taken Greek, I mean, ancient Greek and stuff, you know, that a lot of people, might, that wasn't difficult. Physics. And when you take physics, you have to, you, have to you, you know, when you do it, everything is in meters per second, not feet per second, meters per second. Who uses meters here, you know? I was taking this to the University of Maryland. I don't use meters. What's a meter? And so, and then you had to take it and convert it and do all that and then reconvert it back into meters. And it was something. And, and I was going to, uh, I nearly dropped, I tried to drop the class, actually. And the professor wouldn't let me because if he would have let me, we'd have had too few people. They would have had to kill the whole class. So he guaranteed me I would pass the class. He did. I promise you. I held him to it. I said, you're not lying, are you? I said, because I'll kill you if you are. <laughs> I didn't say that, but uh, that was a difficult class. And he said, you come to me every day you need help. I went to him every day. I went to him every day. My mind doesn't work that way. If, if, if a monkey jumps four feet up in the air, how fast is it going when he hits the ground? Well, you know, I actually know how to do that now. But I've never used physics. But uh, I had to take it. But you better ch change the feet per seconds to meters per second and then change it back before you give your answers. Because on our final, I didn't do that. And I missed every question on the final. <laughs> I, I, I did. But the professor told me I'd pass. He said, well, Gary, the only thing you did was you didn't convert it. You were correct. I said, I was correct. He said, yeah. So I passed the class. Because he didn't count off for all of them. I know y'all wanted to hear that story, didn't you? That actually wasn't in my notes. I was thinking of it. But I passed the class with a C. That was the only C I got throughout my entire college career. And I was no more prouder of a grade than that C that I've ever gotten anything. But I had a fear of failure on that class. And I had to overcome that fear, knowing I might. Now, it was in my favor that the class might have had to been dropped if I uh, would have dropped out of it. But nevertheless, I passed the class. But I've still had other failures in life. Life is like that. And graduates, you're going to have that as well. In the midst of World War II, Oxford University asked then Prime Minister Winston Churchill to address its commencement exercises. Winston Churchill, dressed in his finest suit, he arrived at the auditorium where the service was to be held with his usual attire. He had a cigar, a cane, and his top hat. Y'all know what he looks like. As Churchill approached the podium, the crowd rose in appreciative applause. 
standing there looking very dignified, he settled the crowd down and asked them to be seated. Standing confidently before the crowd of great admirers, he removed his cigar and placed his top hat on the podium. And Churchill gazed at his waiting audience that included some of the most noted scholars in the world. With an authoritative tone in his voice, he began with these words, Never, never, never give up. Several seconds passed without him saying another word. And then finally he repeated those same words again. Never, never, never give up. There was a deafening silence. As Churchill reached for his hat, steadied himself with his cane, and he left the platform. His commencement address was finished. Never give up. To reach the goal of which Paul spoke, we must also follow the final guideline, and that is to follow your faith. In Hebrews, Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, that Luke read for us as our text this morning. Book of Hebrews being written to Christians who, who were likely struggling in their faith. They were wavering in their dev devotion to Christ because they were going through some hard times. The writer here encourages them to not give up, that others have been victorious, and so can we. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, the Hebrew writer here establishes that all runners need a reference point in running a race. People in a spiritual race are on our spiritual journey. You know what? We need a reference point. If you're in the middle of nowhere and have no idea where you are, the first thing we must always do when trying to find our direction is finding the direction north. When we lived in Colorado, it was easy finding directions. With the Rocky Mountains right there next to you, you knew which direction you were going. The Air Force taught me land navigation, made it easy, daytime, blue skies, reference points. They said, well, let's make it a little harder, so let's do it at night. Okay, but let's do it at night, but you have just bailed out of your aircraft and you can't use any light, and, and you can only move at night because there's an enemy out looking for you. Okay. Well, let's not only do land navigation, let's do it at night, and you're under duress because there's an enemy coming after you, and, oh, you're also in the middle of a blizzard. Okay. <laughs> but it doesn't matter with all of that, no matter what they throw at you, whatever it is in life, as in... As, as a navigational direction, you got to have a reference point. You must have a reference point. To the Christian, your reference point is Jesus Christ. On the day, day six of the ill-fated mission of Apollo 13, a lot of you know this story from, from the movie, but the astronauts needed to make a critical course uh, correction. And if they fail, they might never return to Earth. So to conserve power, they shut down the onboard computer that steered the craft. And the astronauts needed to conduct a 39-second burn of the main engine. How were they going to steer? Astronaut Jim Lovell determined that if they could keep a fixed point in space in view through their tiny window, they could steer the craft manually. 
that focal point turned out to be their destination of earth. As shown in the 1995's hit movie Apollo 13, for 39 agonizing seconds, Lovell focused on keeping the earth in view. By not losing sight of that reference point, the three astronauts avoided disaster. And as you know, they made it home uh, safely. Scripture reminds us to finish your life mission successfully. Hebrews 12, to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Our reference point is Jesus Christ. You can be flexible in many things in life, and you should be. But when it comes to the true north of the Savior and His teachings as a reference point, don't budge. It's easy to become distracted, especially at, for our graduates, especially at first year away from, from home. You need to focus. You need to remove the obstacles. You need to tie into a local church or campus ministry that will help you navigate life. Remember, there are those who have gone before you and always know that, they're, that, that these are a part of that great cloud of witnesses for you. They're rooting for you. We're rooting for you. So to our graduates and to all of us, let me remind you, face your fears. Forget your failures. But always and always follow your faith. Church, this morning, we're going to have an invitation. An invitation for you, if you don't know Christ, if you want to publicly do that today, you have the opportunity. If you've wandered away from Christ and you want to come home, you can do that today, publicly. And I say you can do any of those publicly. You can also get with me or one of the elders uh, later if there's something you need to talk about or you want us to pray with you, if there's something we can do for you. To all of our guests today, and we have so many, keep our bulletin, keep our bulletin. Uh, we, have, we have our phone numbers in there, my phone numbers in there, the elders' phone numbers. Uh, call us if you need us. We have our emails. If you have issues down here, we're your church while you're on vacation. And we're here for you. We want you to know that. Don't be bashful. Call us. If you send me a text at 3 a.m., I won't hear my text. You'll need to call me. That will wake me up. And give me just a minute to get my bearings. But we are here for you in any way that we can. So this morning, church, if there's anyone here subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come right now while together we stand and while we sing.